Good morning. Welcome to Portland Bible Church, our Sunday morning service. It is uh, 10 o'clock. We have another service at 1115. And I'm sure some of our YouTube people are going to be disappointed because we are not connected to YouTube for some strange reason. So please pray for our technology that we can get this taken care of. We seem to have a bug connecting to the YouTube. I know most of you folks are on Facebook, so uh, uh, those who are on YouTube probably are wondering what happened. But uh, we will have that up and posted uh, once we get the problem figured out. We may be able to do it by the second service. We'll see how that works out. So thank you all for joining us at Portland Bible Church for our service this morning. Two services, we have 10 and 11, 15, a little break in between. Also have service on Thursday at 7 o'clock. And again, thank you all for joining with us. Uh, we've been in ministry here for over 50 years. Hard to believe, isn't it? I can't possibly be that old. But uh, after all, Methuselah was 969 years, so I'm just a kid uh, by uh, uh, pre-flood ages, if you will. At any rate, uh, yeah, we have our website, and so you can go there for any materials. Uh, you can also get the audios at any time of any of our past classes uh, over the last 14 years, so they're there available. And also we have a on the home page, you can go to the top, it says doctrines, not the one down in the middle, but at the top, and you can drop down, the drop down menu will take you to uh, the charts and graphs, things that we're going to be adding there, particularly for Thursday's class dealing with the chronology of the pre-flood uh, people. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later. Uh, but anything else you can find there, the doctrines and so forth. So uh, also, once we get the YouTube up, uh, that's usually there. You can go to the services and you can get it live when we have it connected. And if not, you can go back to previous classes that will take you to there. And there's a link to YouTube. Well... Uh, it's always customary to take a few moments for silent prayer at the beginning of every class to make sure that we're all in fellowship. And I need this time to get in fellowship too because I was distressed about the uh, fact that we don't have live YouTube today. But uh, we're up on Facebook, so uh, uh, praise the Lord for that. So we'll take a moment or two for silent prayer to make sure that we're in fellowship, all of us, and uh, then I'll close in audible prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your magnificent gift of salvation, unknown to many, sadly, in our world even today. Nevertheless, you have planned from eternity past that we might have fellowship with you, a relationship with you that extends into eternity and has blessings and rewards and things that are beyond our comprehension in this life. We thank you that we have been able to uncover this information through your Holy Spirit and understand the things that you have prepared for us, both in this life and in the life to come. We thank you for the freedom that we still have in these United States to assemble and to worship you in the way that your word instructs us. We thank you that we can come together. We recognize that there are some adversities that we need to overcome, such as our technical difficulties. And we pray uh, that you would help us with those. And we thank you for the technology that allows us to reach literally hundreds of people at great distances with the message that you've given to me this morning. We thank you for that and all my colleagues who do likewise and are teaching the word of God uh, to the best of their understanding through your Holy Spirit and that they are teaching in a literal understanding of your scripture. We thank you for all these men. We thank you for the message this morning. Pray that your Holy Spirit would undergird us, that it would encourage, challenge, and motivate us. And we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. The word of God is alive and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, of the joints and marrow, and is a critic of the thoughts and intents of the heart. All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Study to show yourself approved unto God, workmen that need not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Last night I was thinking about uh, the fact that uh, people often ask me uh, during this uh, adversity that we're having nationally and worldwide, they'll say, what can I do? What can we do? And I put that question to the top of this, and here's what we can do. The most important thing that we can do is what we're doing right now, studying the Word of God. That's the most important thing we can do. 
So if you're listening and uh, uh, joining with us or you're somewhere else studying with another pastor that teaches the Word of God, that's exactly where you should be. This is exactly what you need to be doing right now and as much as you can day by day. We have literally hundreds of messages. You can go back so you're not without a pastor at any time uh, as far as this teaching of the Word of God. But right now, that's what you should be doing, studying the Word of God. And of course, the second thing is that we pray. Prayer is powerful, and we need to pray for our nation at this time. We need to pray for our leadership. We need to pray that establishment principles would come to their minds and that uh, people who know you in a personal way might come to those in Congress uh, and in our leadership positions who do not know you, that they might have an opportunity to receive Jesus Christ as Savior and therefore to be able to study and know the mind of God, of course, which is what we have in our Bible. And if anyone is here without uh, salvation, if they're here without the Lord Jesus Christ, then that, of course, is most important, first of all. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is God, that he came into human history in, a, in the person of Jesus Christ in his physical body. He lived a sinless life, went to the cross, bore the sins of every member of the human race. And uh, that's the issue right there. And so uh, studying the Word of God, praying, praying for our nation, praying for everything, uh, pray for the technology that we are using right this minute to broadcast uh, to hundreds and hundreds of people out there. And, of course, if you're not a believer, make sure you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the Scripture says you will be saved. Well, if I don't get anything else covered today, that's the message right there. So, uh, however, uh, we are studying the book of Hebrews, so uh, hopefully you will stay tuned for the rest of the message this morning. Remember the local church is what we are and uh, the local church is really the classroom for the royal family. Yes, you are royalty. We are royalty by virtue of being in Christ. He is the King of kings and Lord of lords and we are joint heirs with him forever. We share everything that Jesus Christ is and has except his deity. Uh, he is undiminished deity as well as true humanity. But in his resurrected body, everything that he possesses, all of the inheritance, everything that is given to him by the Father, which always he had as God, but is given as a result of his work on the cross and his resurrection, we now share in that destiny. What a marvelous thing it is. So the Bible's our textbook, and of course we know from Proverbs that the Word of God, wisdom, is your very life. So that's what we're doing here. People say, why is this so important? That's why it is so important. Now, in the book of Hebrews, we just started it. We're down to verse 8. We've been looking in the first section, of course, at uh, some of the wonderful things related to the deity of Jesus Christ. We had eight facts early on that described Jesus as undiminished deity. Yes, he was true humanity, but the writer of Hebrews wants us to understand as he did those early Hebrew believers, that Jesus Christ is not only the Savior, but he is God. He is undiminished deity, what we call the hypostatic union. He is two persons in one. He is both God and man, without mixture, and yet uh, uh, totally um, under, difficult to understand for us, but uh, it is true. And so as a human being, he lived a sinless life and paid the price of our sins on the cross and was resurrected. As deity, uh, he never changed. Even the scripture itself, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The second part, beginning in verse 4 of Hebrews chapter 1 through 14, which is the section that we are now in, deals with the superiority of the Messiah, that is Jesus Christ, to the angels. And of course, he goes all the way down through verse 14, and most of these verses uh, from verse 5 on are Old Testament quotations or excerpts pardon me, from Old Testament passages that deal with the Lord Jesus Christ, what we call messianic references in the Old Testament. I've had people often say, well, where's Jesus Christ in the Old Testament? And my answer to that is everywhere. Uh, he is the very essence of the Word of God, but many passages specifically state the fact that he would come into human history, and we've noted uh, at least 20 of those already, 21, uh, in the Psalms, but there are also multitudes of other passages 
passages, really starting with the book of Job uh, and uh, uh, the books of Genesis and other passages all through the scriptures, including uh, all of the prophets. All right, so we got down then to uh, the fact that uh, Jesus is to be worshipped by the angels. That was verses 6 and 7. And verse 8 is where we start today. So verse 8, we're starting there. And verse 8 is actually the fifth quotation from the Old Testament. So if you will turn with me just to see it over in the book of Psalms, in Psalms 45, Psalm 45. We have the direct quotation. Uh, we have noted this, of course, in our study of the Messianic Psalms. And Psalm 45, verse 6, and actually we see that it continues on, but uh, we'll look at this one. Verse 6, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of uprightness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So that's the quotation that we have here, and it's basically the same. Uh, we have noted in the past in our introduction that the quotations, curiously enough, that the writer of Hebrews used are from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which certainly gives some validation to the Greek translation. There are some specific areas in the Greek translations that differ from the Hebrew of the Masoretic text, which is the received Old Testament Hebrew text. Nevertheless, when they are quoted in the New Testament, they become the word of God because under inspiration, God has elected to allow the writer of Hebrews to use those quotations. They are never so much different than the Hebrew uh, as to be difficult or uh, uh, confusing, but many of them seem to have a bit of editing uh, as far as the person of Christ. But this one is pretty straightforward, as you see. Verse 8 reads this way in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 8. But of the Son, of the Son, he says. The word he says is not there, but the reference, of course, is the Father speaking with regard to the Son. Now, it tandems on verse 7, so we'll go back and pick that up just in terms of reading. Verse 7 says, And to the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? That's basically uh, a statement, but it's kind of in the form of a question as well. Who does it? Well, Jesus Christ is the creator. Nothing came into existence except what came into existence through his creative hand. The father of the three members of the Trinity is the planner. Jesus Christ is the executor, the one who actually did the work of creation. The Holy Spirit, as you know, is the revealer and restorer. So who makes the angels winds and his ministers a flame of fire? We looked at that last time and noted that that who refers to the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, all of these verses, according to the writer of Hebrews, as they are quoted, refer to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the very essence of the book of Hebrews, that Christ fulfills all these Old Testament passages. So in verse 8, he continues, but conversely, in other words, he makes the angels, and of course they are to worship him, that is Jesus Christ, from verse 6. But now he says, but of the Son, not of the angels, but of the Son, and they have edited here in the uh, New American Standard, and I expect many other translations add the words that would be implied. He says, he being, of course, the Father, thy throne, your throne, O God. The interesting thing here is that God the Father says your throne to a second person. We believe the second person of the Trinity. Your throne, O God. So the second person of the Trinity is definitely here referred to as deity. Another passage that shows the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, so many powerful statements in the book of Hebrews. It's just hard to catalog them. So we'll just take them as they come verse by verse. But thy throne, your throne, throne, Jesus Christ's throne, O God, is forever and ever. Well, we know that God is forever and ever, but also as the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, all three members are eternal. There never was a time when God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, as we understand them, did not exist. There never will be a time in the future, as we understand it, that they will not exist. God is eternal in three persons, and here is the direct statement that the relationship 
the Son is also forever and ever. Now the throne, of course, is something that comes through the historic work of Jesus Christ. He was given a throne as part of the inheritance on earth. So he came into human history, and after the work of the cross, he was given a special name, an adult name, and we noted that previously in verse 5, where it says uh, that uh, thou art my son, today I have begotten thee. We spent some time there saying that uh, Jesus was always the son of God in terms of relationship, but in terms of the ancient uh, his history of nations, generally when a young man, or a young woman for that matter, became of age, they were considered considered an adult son, and they were so designated. We think of it in terms of being able to uh, 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 be involved in elections or perhaps even drink alcoholic beverages or drive cars. We have certain ages at which we are considered to be adults. I'm not sure we always are, but uh, the point is that even in our society, we have certain dates. You know, we don't allow 10-year-old uh, people to uh, drive cars, for example, and so forth. So there are age restrictions, but when you become of age. That's the idea. And Jesus became, as it were, of age in his humanity after the resurrection. And that's where we get that particular phrase. But here it says the throne. The throne is what is yet future. And we see that over in Daniel chapter 7, 13. We've been there many, many times. 13 and 14, where Jesus Christ apparently comes before the Father and is given an eternal throne and kingdom. And so there's the picture of what we see here uh, as prophetic with regard to the future in this quotation which really came from the book of Psalms but here it is in Hebrews and yet the throne for Jesus Christ is actually future when he will come back to earth and reign during that millennial kingdom and it says thy throne is forever that means in the future it will go on and on not just for the millennial thousand years but forever and ever after that but uh, he says here concerning the son the definite article with son uh, we have uh, the, uh, the word the in the Greek, which indicates specificity. So the son means it's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only son uh, that God has in terms of this relationship. And we have uh, <clears throat> the throne, of course, which is a specific throne. This is the throne that he will sit on during the millennial kingdom. And then we have, oh God. It's interesting here, the Oh, God uh, is basically including a definite article. It's kind of interesting in the Greek. It's the uh, letter O. Uh, we pronounce it as ho. It's a rough breathing. Ho theos. But the, in the Greek, if you look at it, it's oh, God. It's actually an O, oh, although in the Greek it's the definite article. But anyway, I just thought that was, that's kind of a, a, a pastor joke there. It probably was probably most of you. At any rate, I went, oh. O Theos, oh, O oh God. But the point is the God. So the Son is the God. Uh, it's almost what we call an apposition, which means the Son is the God. We could kind of put an equal sign there. The Son, uh, the throne of the Son, O oh God. Uh, and O oh God refers definitely to Jesus Christ. It is forever and ever. We have the standard phrase in the Greek, ice tone, Iona, to Ionas. Uh, the word ion means ages or era, and when it's put into this framework, uh, it is a pattern for the ages of the ages, literally, unto the ages of the ages, usually translated forever and forever. Uh, we see this over and over again, many, many places. Uh, just to look at a couple, we won't look at all of them. I have a whole list here. Uh, we'll just go to a, a few. Isaiah 57, and we'll be there more times. Uh, so we will look at that one. So this is referring to the forever and ever concept. And some might say, well, this is not necessarily referring to Jesus. Uh, we believe it is, but some might say that. But in Isaiah 57, uh, uh, verses uh, 50, uh, did I say 57? Yeah, 57, uh, verses 15. So Isaiah 57, 15. Oh, there it is. Okay. 15. For thus says the high and exalted one who lives forever, whose name is holy, and also with the contrite 
and lowly of spirit in order to revive the spirit of the lonely and to revive the heart of the contrite. For I will not contend with ever. In other words, he's not going to strive against them, but also will uh, come to a point where they are blessed instead of having contention. At any rate, we have his word is forever. He lives forever. We see it in Isaiah chapter 9. Isaiah 9, a very famous passage. You'll recognize it as soon as you get there. In Isaiah 9, 6. Isaiah 9, 6 and 7. Oft quoted. And of course it refers to both the first and the second advent and the deity of Jesus Christ. All in these two verses. They're rather lengthy verses in the Bible. It says, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Reference to the incarnation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the government will rest on his shoulder. That can't be in the past because he wasn't in charge of anything. He was crucified and resurrected before he could begin the reign. In fact, that was the fact that the uh, millennial kingdom was postponed because he was rejected by the leadership in Israel and many of the people. And so the kingdom was postponed, but it will come. And it says, the government will, future tense, rest on his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful Counselor, uh, Mighty God. There's the deity of Jesus Christ. His government is in the future, and he will be called Mighty God. He will even be called Eternal Father. And uh, that always troubles people. They think, well, this is God the Father. Uh, this doesn't refer to uh, Jesus Christ. Well, it does because he's also the Prince of Peace. Not only that, when Jesus uh, was asked by his disciples, show us the Father. Remember that? And he said, it'll, they said, it'll be enough. And he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am the very essence, the express image, as we find in many passages, uh, not the least of which is Hebrews. Uh, we see that Jesus Christ is the essence of the eternal Father. And right there it is, eternal. That means uh, no beginning, no end. So Isaiah 9, and that's verse 6, Prince of Peace. Verse 7 says, There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it, to uphold it with justice and righteousness. And here it comes. From then on, that is through the millennial kingdom, that is the Davidic kingdom that was promised to David, promised to Abraham as a king who would rule. And then he says, from then on forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Of course, that's probably referring to God the Father who establishes the plan, but Jesus Christ is the one who fulfills the plan. Other passages that we could look at, Isaiah 40, verse 28. Uh, leave that for your own study. Psalm 90, we have already discussed. Psalm 90, verse 2. Psalm 93, 2. Psalm 102, 27. Other passages. Let's go to Ezekiel 37. Ezekiel 37. This is one of my favorites, Ezekiel 37, verse 24 through 28. Again, referring to David. Uh, David, of course, will have resurrection body and the kingdom, and he will be the regent ruler over Jerusalem, Jesus Christ being king of kings and lord of lords. And my servant David will be king over them. Some interpreters say that this is a reference to Jesus Christ, uh, but uh, it doesn't say uh, David's greater son. It is a direct statement to David who will reign uh, over Jerusalem in that future. Now, Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords, but David will have a resurrection body during the kingdom. He gets his resurrection body at the second advent and, of course, will have this area of leadership and rulership. And so uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum and many colleagues uh, uh, believe that this is not the Lord Jesus Christ here, but is a direct reference to David in resurrection body. Uh, he'll be king over them. And they will all have one shepherd, and they will walk in my ordinances and keep my statutes and observe them. The one shepherd, of course, refers to both David, but more likely it refers to the great high shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the fact that it says keeping the ordinances and the statutes, that refers to two aspects of the Mosaic Covenant. And they shall live on the land. This, of course, is aside from our study this morning, but is a reference to Israel living in Jerusalem on the land. That I gave to Jacob, my servant, in which your fathers uh, lived. 
and they will live on it. That is on the land. The land is going to exist during the millennial kingdom. Uh, the world isn't going to be ending. There's at least a thousand years uh, and seven uh, if the rapture occurred right now. So we've got that to look forward to. And their sons and their sons' sons, sons forevermore. Wow. That looks pretty eternal there. And David, my servant, shall be their prince forever. Well, if David in his resurrection body is going to last forever, then I think the Lord Jesus Christ as King of Kings and Lord of Lords will live forever as well. But wait, as they say on the TV infomercial, but wait, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It will be an everlasting covenant with them and I will place them and multiply them and will set my sanctuary in their midst forever. God will place a sanctuary in the midst of Israel. We have discussed it and studied it in Isaiah, as well as Ezekiel. Uh, the chapters from 40 through 48 describe it in, increment, in incredible detail. My dwelling place also will be with them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. But that's not all. And the nations will know that I am the Lord. There will be nations during the millennial kingdom. When David rules over Jerusalem, when Jesus Christ rules as King of kings and Lord of lords. And so I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel, sets Israel apart. In spite of their failings over the centuries, he has set them apart as a priest nation. And they will return and they will become a people uh, of his own desire during the kingdom. When my sanctuary is in their midst forever. So we have several forevers here and we see that the Lord is eternal in that sense. We have already mentioned Daniel 7.14 and uh, we won't go there but uh, we've been there many times. In Daniel 7.14 it speaks about the Father giving to the Son a kingdom and a domain that will last forever. That will have no end. And then of course we need to go uh, to the passage in the New Testament, again, which is in the Gospel of John, chapter 12. John 12 and verse 24. John 12, 24. Well, looks like I have another glitch here, huh? I have it in bold print, and that uh, doesn't look like the right one. Okay, well, let's see. I think it's 34. Yeah, go down to 34. Looks like I missed that. Thank you very much. All right, 34. The multitude therefore answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ, notice, is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up who is the Son of Man? You see, uh, Jesus was saying the Son of Man has to be lifted up. He was speaking of his crucifixion. Obviously, that was the price paid for the sins of the human race. But, of course, the Old Testament spoke of the Messiah as being forever, being eternal. How can it be that Jesus Christ could be the Messiah? This is what they misunderstood. They misunderstood that he had to do the work of the cross that's borne out in places like Isaiah 52 and 53, as well as many messianic psalms, many uh, prophets that spoke of the crucifixion. We have at least 300 plus, over 300 prophecies of Jesus Christ, many of them pertaining to his first advent. And yet they rejected the fact that there had to be the death of Messiah. All they saw was that he would last forever. And that's their argument. How can you say that you'd be lifted up? And here, lifted up, they understood what he meant. Die, that he would have to die. Uh, and how can you be that? Because Christ is to remain forever. They missed the point that, of course, there was the advent where he had to die on the cross, but that he would be lifted up, not just on the cross, but raised up in resurrection forevermore, and therefore he would be eternal. So there's a passage that even the Old Testament law describes Jesus Christ as having reference to this uh, uh, idea. We see it in Psalm 110.4, for example. It says that he would be a priest forever. And uh, uh, the idea we have, uh, we're actually looking at that. Let's go over there just for a moment. Many of you have been studying the 110th Psalm. And the 110th Psalm, of course, uh, is just filled with references, only seven verses, but we've been there for about four or five weeks. Mm -hmm. 
And some people think, say, are we ever going to finish Psalm 110? We'll get there. But there's so much there. The writer of Hebrews refers to it uh, uh, in terms of the uh, terms of Melchizedek that we looked at last time in verse 4 uh, about uh, uh, six out of the eight times. The other two times are in Genesis and right here. Only two times in the Old Testament. All the rest are in the New Testament. And the writer of Hebrews says that Jesus is after this special priesthood called the order of Melchizedek. And before that, in the same verse, uh, we have three things. The first one is that the Lord, well, actually four, the Lord has promised and won't change his mind. And so this is a promise of God. Secondly, that he won't change his mind. That's the immutability of God. So he's made a promise that he would keep. He is unchangeable, so he can't cast the promise out. And then he says, you are a priest forever. That's the quotation that we see coming up in the book of Hebrews with referring with reference to Jesus Christ and his eternality according to the order of Melchizedek. That priesthood goes on forever. So Psalm 110.4 is powerful, uh, and uh, we'll see that because we're still looking. Hopefully you'll join us on Thursday. We're still looking at Melchizedek. By the way, there's a study on the website, again, in the uh, section that deals with the charts. You can go there. It has Abram and Melchizedek. Uh, we have all the dates and the chronology and how we believe that Abram met Melchizedek, and we believe that it is the person of Shem. Uh, I've given documentation and my evidence and reasons for that. Well, we got down to forever and ever. But concerning this son, concerning the son, thy throne, that is your son, throne, O son, uh, O God, is forever and ever. And as the verse continues, he says, thy scepter of uprightness, the scepter of uprightness, the scepter of your kingdom. Once again, your, referring to this person, the Lord Jesus Christ, kingdom. We have the definite article with it. It's not in the English. It just says the ki uh, your kingdom. But in the Greek, it's the kingdom of y'all. And that is a singular you of Jesus Christ. So it refers to the specific millennial kingdom in the future. And so we have the scepter here mentioned twice. The scepter of uprightness, a scepter of your kingdom. The word scepter, we have already worked over that in the Old Testament. I think we looked at that, if you remember, those who have studied with us in Psalm 23. There are a number of words for rod. Uh, you have the shepherd's crook. You have uh, a rod of discipline. Sometimes the lower end of the shepherd's crook is used for discipline. The upper edge, uh, the, the, the curved edge of the shepherd's crook for uh, delivering people. So this word uh, for the shepherd's crook or rod, Rod, a number of different Hebrew words that describe it, but also in certain contexts such as this, it can refer to the scepter. The scepter was the rod or the pole, usually made out of some precious metal like gold or silver, and maybe had a decoration on the top of the particular kingdom, and the kingdom would wield this. And if he pointed this at someone, they could come in. If someone was judged, he could point it to them, and they were judged, and they could be executed. So the scepter was the authority authority of the king. And so this is the rod of uprightness. Jesus Christ is a righteous uh, part of the Godhead. Uh, the scriptures in 1 John say Jesus Christ, the righteous one. When we get saved, we have the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ because we're entered into union with him. So this scepter represents the very righteousness of God to judge righteously and to, uh, 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 to take vengeance if necessary, as he will, during the uh, tribulation time and the battle of Armageddon. And then the second word, the scepter of your kingdom. This represents that he is just the king. He's not just some local guy that uh, assumes authority and wields authority without any reason. He is the king. Uh, the book of Revelation calls him the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So the first one, the righteous scepter, is the rod of justice, we might say. It's the rod of authority. The second one, of course, uh, is the 
uh, the ruling authority, the fact that he is the one who will rule during the millennium. And so they are uh, basically the same word in the Hebrew, but they are differentiated by the word scepter of righteousness and the scepter of your kingdom, the rulership, as well as the judgment that comes. So all of these things we see many, many places. I have so many verses here, we just won't be able to cover them all, uh, dealing with the authority and sovereignty uh, with the idea of the scepter or the rod. And so I'm going to bypass that. The only ones that I'll mention, for example, are Aaron's rod that budded. You'll remember that. It's referenced in Hebrews 9, 4. And of course, in the Old Testament, they had a problem with recognizing Aaron and Moses' authority. And so God said, well, take a rod and uh, just a dead stick. And uh, put them uh, uh, and, and put them away, and uh, we'll we'll de designate uh, the different tribes uh, on there with the buds or whatever, uh, or however it is they're going to set that up. And so it turned out that none of them budded except the rod. Uh, I'm sorry, there were several rods. Yeah, there were several rods, and they were all dead sticks. And they put them in, and only one stick had a bud, and that was the rod of Aaron, which indicated that that was the, the stick, if you will, the rod of authority. So there we see kind of a scepter, same word, his rod, budded because he was the authority. Remember Moses said, well, I don't speak very well. <laughs> and uh, and uh, God said, don't worry, Aaron can speak for you. I remember a pastor quipped one time, uh, for a man that didn't sp speak very well, he had a lot to say. Uh, but uh, that was his complaint to God. Well, I I'm not really a good speaker. And God said, don't worry, I'll let Aaron do it for you. And so uh, Aaron had authority as Moses did. And uh, Aaron's authority was established by this rod which is a scepter, if you will, of authority. The other one was uh, the uh, staff of Jacob mentioned in Hebrews 11:21. Uh, we know that Jacob had some difficulties, and he's mentioned there with the great ones, but he's only mentioned in connection with his blessing of his sons. Kind of interesting. That's a story all of its own. But he is mentioned there as having a staff, and the staff of God had given him so that he would designate blessing uh, to his children, particularly his sons. That's in 11. 21 of Hebrews. We'll see it a little bit later. All right, so that gets us through uh, this concept. And then as far as the kingdom, again, I have many, many passages that deal with this. Uh, too many to mention now. We've already seen Isaiah 9, 7, where Jesus Christ will have the kingdom forever. We've already mentioned Daniel 7, 13 and uh, 14 and even verse 27, where the kingdom is described in that chapter of Daniel. And so uh, we have psalms that describe this as well. We noted it. We studied the 22nd psalm. I refer you back to verse 27 and 28 of Psalm 22. Let's look at, uh, as we close this section, 145. Psalm 145, 13. Psalm 145, verse 13. Again, the argument could be made. This is a fact that this is God the Father and not the Son, yet it says, thy kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and thy dominion endures throughout all generations. Well, that's certainly true for the Father, but in Daniel chapter 7, the Father gives the kingdom to the Son forever, so the kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion, that's a reference, we believe, to Jesus Christ, endures throughout all generations. Well, many other things that we could say, but but I want to move on to verse 9. So we have the sixth Old Testament quotation in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 9. You see, all the way from 5 down through 13, we have Old Testament quotations. And we have even seen uh, uh, the fact that uh, Jesus is referred to over and over here, even in verse 13, as sitting at the right hand of God. I don't know how many passages we looked at that referred to him both in the New Testament as well as this quotation that we looked at in Psalm 110, verse 1, <laughs> several weeks ago. Okay, so verse number 
number nine. The Old Testament quotation number six. This is in Psalm 45, seven. We looked at 45, six. So let's go to 45, seven, the very next verse. And so he takes these right out of the Psalms and verse seven of Psalm 45. We did verse six. Remember, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Thy scepter of uprightness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Direct quotation there in Hebrews 1, eight. And seven, Psalm 45, 7, Thou hast loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has anointed thee with the oil of joy above your fellows. Well, here once again we have the deity of Christ described. He's talking about the God, O God, and it's a reference here to the Son, Jesus Christ. And going back to the context, if you look up at the top, all of these... Uh, it talks about uh, reference to Jesus Christ. It, look at verse 6 of Hebrews 1. And when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says. So everything that God the Father says after the resurrection of Christ, he says with reference to the Son. Every verse we have seen. And here in verse 9, he says of the Son, Thou, the Son, has loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore, God... Your God, that is, therefore God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness or joy above your companions or uh, fellows, as we see. And so the word God, therefore God, he is speaking to Jesus Christ. Therefore God. God the Father says to the Son, therefore God. <laughs> and so the duality here of the Trinity, we see the Father and the Son. Therefore God, Jesus Christ, your God, well, who's Jesus Christ God, as it were? Well, the Father. In terms of the relationship, the Father is the planner. The Son is the revealer. Therefore, God, Jesus Christ, your God, that is the Father, has anointed you, God the Son. Make no mistake. Now, this is New Testament Hebrew being written, but it is a direct quotation from the Old Testament describing the deity of the Son and the deity of the Father, both referred to as God. It doesn't get any better than that. You can see why uh, the Old Testament, uh, under, those who understood the Old Testament, even the rabbis, had, you know, they pulled their hair out of these passages. How could God be two people or two gods? How could you have two gods? Because the Shema of Israel says the Lord our God is one God. And yet here, clearly, in Psalm 45, 7, there are two deities. Two members, we say, of the Godhead, one God, but in three persons, three functionalities. Therefore, God, Jesus Christ, your God, God the Father, has anointed you, God the Son, thee here, with the oil of gladness above your companions. And so... The first thing, then, is this idea of righteousness. Jesus Christ is the righteous. He hated lawlessness. All right? Nothing difficult there. And then we have the fact that uh, he, the Father, has anointed the Son. Well, what's the oil of gladness? Well, that's pretty easy. We have the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus Christ, of course, is deity. And so it's not that he needs to have the Holy Spirit, as it were. He was born spiritually alive just as Adam was before the sin. But then there's a special anointing of the Holy Spirit that came upon him. You remember when the dove came down and the Father said uh, from heaven, Behold, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. That's where the Holy Spirit anointed him. The anointing has to do with his ministry. He was always the Son and he was always chosen and he always had the Holy Spirit because he's God. But he was anointed with specific declaration in human history in his humanity his humanity was declared to be the one who would be uh, the messiah as far as the ministry was concerned so we have the anointing with the oil of gladness and it's above his companions now we have the holy spirit but we don't have the anointing that jesus had in order to minister in the way that he did to heal the way he did and to go to the cross and to bear the sins yes pastors have anointing 
anointing. Yes, every one of us has an anointing for the ministries that God has given severally to us through the Holy Spirit, but none of us has the ministry that Jesus Christ had. He had a special, if you will, anointing, and that is above his partners, his companions, his fellows. The word for companions here is the word metakoi. Metakoi means participants and sharers. In the New Testament, it means those of us who come to church, those who participate. When you participate in the communion, you're a sharer in the communion. So this word basically means partners or sharers or participants. And the other participants with Jesus Christ are the members of the human race who believe in him and therefore they're joint heirs and partners they would be considered fellows uh, or sharers and of course uh, some would see this as having to do with the angels as well and he certainly is uh, above the angels uh, so if you see this as the angelic host fine if you see it as the human race of believers either way he is above all human beings in that he is the glorified resurrected savior and he is above all the angels which really is the sense of this passage well i've got a few more things here to look at in connection with this anointing but it's basically the beginning of his ministry so we'll start there uh, in our uh, oh we've got a little bit of time okay i think i can finish this up we've got about four or five minutes left uh, basically i mentioned that the anointing here it's only found five times in the new testament curiously enough in luke and acts and second corinthians and of course uh, here in hebrews 1 9 but but it refers to his baptism and his baptism, of course, uh, by John when the dove came down and said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. It wasn't the dove that said that. It was God the Father. At any rate, he, he had a ministry and his ministry was threefold in his humanity. It was prophet and it was priest and king. The priest and king aspect will come in the future because he will be a priest after the order of Melchizedek and he will be king of kings and lord of lords. But remember, even at his birth, those who came from the east brought gifts that they would as to a king. So prophetically, he was the king from birth. But he doesn't get the crown until the second advent when he gets the kingdom. As far as prophet, he was a prophet. He prophesied his own death. He prophesied many things during his life, as you know. And of course, a priest, he did not perform the works of a priest, but he will in the millennium be the high priest after that order of Melchizedek. So we see this. Uh, one other place I might look, Isaiah chapter 11, 1 and 2. Isaiah 11. one and two here we have the idea of the holy spirit uh it actually goes all the way down uh, through verse 12 uh so we'll say that you can look at that on your own but 11 uh, isaiah 11 1 and 2 says this then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of jesse jesse was david's father and a branch from his roots will bear fruit the Spirit of the Lord will rest upon him. That's this anointing that we have here. It's a spirit of wisdom <clears throat> and understanding. It's a spirit of counsel and strength. It's a spirit of knowledge and reverence to the Lord. That would be the Father. He will delight in the reverence of the Lord. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes, or, nor make decision by what he hears with his ears, but righteousness he will judge the poor, and so forth. And of course, then we see the second advent in verse 4, and he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he will slay the wicked. Also, righteousness will be the belt about his thighs, and faithfulness about his waist. And then the next verses deal with the millennial kingdom. So here we see that the Spirit, in verse 2, will rest upon him. That's exactly what we have right here in the book of Hebrews 1, 9. He has anointed you, Jesus Christ, with the oil of gladness, Isaiah 11, 1 and 2, above or beyond your partners, the human race, believers in Jesus Christ, and certainly above the angels. Well, I think we'll take a little break. We'll come back and pick it up with verse 10 after the break. Father, we thank you so much for the opportunity of studying these passages 
demonstrating the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have yet begun to fight in this passage. There is so much more that we're going to look at. We thank you, Father, for inspiring the writer of Hebrews, whoever he was, to write these things to clarify for us what the Old Testament had to say about our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And Father, if there's one here without Christ, without hope, without eternal life, we want that person to know that you had them in mind when you sent your son into the world to bear the sins of the human race. He lived a sinless life and was qualified as the second Adam to go to the cross and bear the sins of every member of the human race, past, present, and future, once for all time. And all that you have to do as a an individual is to believe that Jesus Christ is that one. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior. And if you believe in him, you will have everlasting life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him would not perish but have everlasting life. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Father, thank you again for these principles and these passages that we have considered. We pray that you would put them into our <clears throat> permanent store of doctrine in our soul and that we might live by them, understanding the Savior that you have provided for us and our eternal destiny in him. For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.